In this lesson, we're going to learn all about quadratic functions. Now, a function that can be expressed in the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a does not equal 0, is called a quadratic function. There are two common forms for the equation of a quadratic function, the one that we just saw, which is called general form. So f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And the second, which is called standard, or sometimes referred to as vertex form, which is f of x equals a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. You can change general form into standard form using the process of completing the square, and you can change standard form into general form just using FOIL. Standard form is especially useful when it comes to graphing quadratic functions. So let's take a look at some properties of graphs of quadratics. So the graph of a quadratic is always in the shape of a parabola that either opens up if the uh, coefficient a is greater than 0, or down if the coefficient a is less than 0. So uh, if it opens upward, the parabola is going to uh, look this, this way. Uh, so that's when a is greater than 0. And if it opens downward, uh, the parabola is going to look this way. And that's, of course, when a is less than 0. The highest or lowest point on the parabola, uh, which is referred to as a maximum or a minimum, is called the vertex, and it's located at the point hk uh, if your equation is written in standard form. So the vertex is uh, this point right down here. Uh, in this case, it would be a minimum, or right up here for this case to be a maximum. Uh, a parabola also possesses vertical symmetry uh, through what's called its line of symmetry or axis of symmetry, depending on uh, which textbook you're reading, which always has the equation, equation x equals h. So the h is the uh, x-coordinate of your vertex, and it's always passing through the vertex. So it's a vertical line. Uh, and we generally draw that vertical line as a dashed line but it's passing right through the um, x-coordinate of your vertex. And that's why the equation is always just x equals h. And it doesn't matter if that line is uh, the axis for a parabola opening upward or downward. The equation is always x equals h. The domain of a quadratic function is always negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh, the range is either going to be from k up to positive infinity or negative infinity up to k, depending on whether the parabola opens up or down. So, for instance, you know, I generally refer to finding domain and range as imagining the graph being smashed up against the x or the y axis. So if you smash this graph up against the uh, y axis, this point is included. All of these points are included. So this is my range. So it starts at uh, the value k and goes up to positive infinity. So k to positive infinity. So that's my range if the graph is opening up. Or the range if the graph is opening down looks like this. So it starts. Uh, from negative infinity and goes up to k. So my range here would be like this. So it always is just dependent upon uh, the y-coordinate of where your vertex lies. Uh, some different aspects of parabolas. Um, first is what's called a y-intercept. And a y-intercept Every parabola possesses a y-intercept, and it's the location where the graph intersects 
the y-axis. Uh, in general, for any function, you can locate a y-intercept by calculating f of 0. All right, so for instance, uh, in the case of a parabola, uh, my y-intercept is this point right here that I've kind of highlighted. So that's the point where the graph crosses the y-axis. Uh, we say it intersects because if it intersects the y-axis, uh, a graph could touch it, you know, and then not actually pass through it, but it still counts as a y-intercept. In this case, the parabola does actually cross through at that point. So um, what we're looking at, however, is basically when the graph is uh, the x-coordinate of the graph is 0, because at this particular point, the x-coordinate is 0, and the y-coordinate is whatever this uh, value is right here, f evaluated at 0. That's how we get the um, y-intercept. Now, if the quadratic is expressed in general form, so the ax squared plus bx plus c, the y-intercept is just located at 0, c. And the reason that is, if you have to calculate f of 0, and your equation is in the form a times x squared, oops, I said x, but I meant to plug in 0 for x, plus b times x, so plug in 0 for x, plus c, well, this has a factor of 0, so that whole term goes to 0. This whole factor uh, goes to 0 as well. So if you have your quadratic listed in general form, just look to the constant. That's going to be your y-intercept. So this actually reduces down to just 0, c. As long as you're in general form. That doesn't work for um, standard form or vertex form. All right, x-intercepts. Let's talk about those. Now, you can probably guess here that an x-intercept is a location where a graph intersects the x-axis. Uh, in general, this occurs when f of x is equal to 0. So if you'll recall here, you know, f of x is equal to our y values. So basically, we're looking to where y is equal to 0. And y is equal to 0 on the x-axis. That's why this works. Now, what's interesting is a parabola may have 0, 1, or 2 x-intercepts, depending on a value called the discriminant, which is b squared minus 4ac which you probably recognize as the part of the quadratic formula. And the quadratic formula looks like x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of, oops, <laughs> sorry, the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So you might recognize that as the part that's underneath the square root. And the reason that's important is, for instance, if b squared minus 4ac is greater than 0, we, that means you have a positive number underneath your square root. And if you have a positive number underneath your square root, then you can take the square root. And that's perfectly acceptable. Well, um, if that's the case, you are going to have two x-intercepts. So your parabola is going to have two x-intercepts in that situation. All right, so your discriminant is greater than zero in that, in that case. Next, your discriminant could be equal to zero. Well, if your discriminant is equal to zero, you know, think about what would happen up here in the quadratic formula. Um, if b squared minus 4ac was equal to 0, then this whole thing would just basically reduce down to negative b over 2a, which is just a single number. It doesn't have that plus or minus, because if you add and subtract 0, nothing really happens. In that situation, your parabola is only going to have one x-intercept, so like this.
And the what's happening there is your parabola is coming down, touching the x-axis, and basically bouncing back away. So it's only uh, intersecting the x-axis at one single point. Now lastly, b squared minus 4ac could be less than 0. And if that's the case, you're trying to take the square root of a negative number, which is undefined. And what the mathematics is trying to tell you there is that the parabola never crosses the x-axis. So you would have zero x-intercepts in that situation. So your parabola could have one, two, or zero x-intercepts depending on this value. Now, uh, I've drawn these all as parabolas facing upward. The same situation occurs if the parabola points downward. It still would be, you know, similar cases of zero x-intercepts, one x-intercept, or two x-intercepts. Um, so for, gen for no loss of generality, um, I have just drawn them pointing upward. Now, when you solve the equation f of x equals zero, so you're looking for the locations of x-intercepts. The result are called the zeros of the quadratic. There's always going to be two zeros of a quadratic function. That's uh, a property of the degree of the equation. So it's a degree two equation, meaning that the exponent, um, the highest exponent on any term is two. And that tells me that there's going to be two zeros. Now, if the zeros are real numbers, which means they're rational or irrational, rational meaning it could be written as a fraction, irrational meaning, you know, it has to do something with the square root. So if it's like a over b, that's rational. Square root of c, irrational. Um, and these aren't a, b, and c from the quadratics. They're just random numbers. So I'm just showing you irrational is going to involve a square root. Rational is going to involve a fraction. So if the zeros are real numbers, then these are the locations of the x-intercepts. However, if the zeros are complex, which means that you were down here in this case right here where the discriminant was less than zero, and you're taking the uh, square root of a negative number, that leads to complex values. So like a plus bi, so you involve that i. Well, you still have two zeros, it's just those zeros are not intercepts. So they're only intercepts if the numbers are real numbers. Another uh, thing to note here is when the discriminant b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero and a perfect square, um, you get two rational zeros. So in that situation, you know, again, like I said, this is a fraction. Um, and when it's not a perfect square, you get two irrational zeros. So you get these when you have, um, you know, square roots in your answer. So um, you can kind of break down that first category into two further um, situations. Uh, let's look at a few examples of finding x-intercepts. So let's start with f of x equals x squared plus 10x plus 16. Now, um, checking the discriminant which is b squared minus 4ac. Alright, so b is equal to 10, so this is going to be 10 squared minus 4 times a is 1 and c is 16, so 1 times 16. This is 100 minus 64, which is 36. So it's a positive number, so that means I'm going to have two x-intercepts, but also it's actually a perfect square which means that they're going to be two rational uh, zeros. And what's interesting about that is uh, it also tells me that this polynomial will factor. Okay, So I could solve for these x-intercepts 
just through the process of factoring. So 8 and 2, if they're both positive, look like they will work. So if I set these equal to 0, I've got x plus 8 equals 0, and x plus 2 equals 0. So x equals negative 8, and x equals negative 2. And there are my uh, two x-intercepts. Now, when you give your final answer for x-intercepts, uh, depending on your situation, you may have to express these as coordinate pairs, and it's easy to do. You just take the x equals negative 8, for instance, and write it as the coordinate pair negative 8, 0, and x equals negative 2 as negative 2, 0. A lot of times when you're working problems, if you're just asked to solve for x-intercepts, you generally will provide your answers in terms of coordinate pairs. But sometimes if you're just graphing and you're not giving those as final answers, then most people understand that the x-intercepts exist along the x-axis. And instead of expressing them that way, just plot them where they're supposed to go. So it kind of just depends on the situation. Um, but I wanted you to be aware because sometimes the, the homework will ask for the x-intercepts and want you to express it point as points, um, so just wanted to make sure you know what to do there. Okay, now just to show you that this works the way that we expected, um, I've taken the graph that we were working with, so y equals um, uh, x squared plus 10x plus 16, and I've graphed it, so you can just see, um, you know, for certain we have two x-intercepts, uh, one is at x equals negative 8, and the other one is located at x equals negative 2. And that way you can really kind of visualize um, exactly what we're uh, doing here. All right, the next example I have, f of x equals x squared plus 4x plus 4. So Again, if I calculate my discriminant, so b squared minus 4ac, that's going to be 4 squared minus 4 times 1 times 4. So 4 squared is 16. This is also 16. My discriminant is 0, which tells me that I have 1x-intercept. So let's see. Let's see what that looks like. Now, again, um, 0 is technically a perfect square, which means I could solve this by factoring. So I'm going to set my parabola equal to 0 and factor it. So x and x, it looks like positive 2 and positive 2 work. So essentially, when I set each of these equal to 0, in order to find the location of my x-intercepts, they both result in the same number. So I still came up with two solutions. That's important because it's a quadratic. It should have two solutions. It's just that the solutions were the same, and that happens from time to time. And so my, my x-intercept, the coordinate pair here, would be negative 2, 0, and there would just be 1. Um, so what that means is when I graph my parabola, and let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so I've changed my uh, function to y equals x squared plus 4x plus 4, the current example, and here is my uh, graph. Notice that it does have an x-intercept at negative 2, but what happens is the graph comes down, it touches the x-axis there, and it kind of bounces back away. Um, so there is, in fact, only one x-intercept for this particular example. OK, for my last example here, we're going to do f of x equals x squared plus 2x plus 5. So I'll check the discriminant to start off. So this is going to be. 4 minus 4 times 1 times 5. 
So 4 minus 20, which is negative 16. Since it's a negative number, I should be only I shouldn't have any x-intercepts. So zero x-intercepts. So let's see what happens. Now it's also actually telling me um, because it's a negative number, um, I'm not going to be able to factor. The result's going to be uh, imaginary complex values, so there's no reason for me to even try factoring. So I'm going to use uh, completing the square, which means I'll move the constant to the other side and uh, I'm going to rearrange my equation. So x squared plus 2x equals 5. Now if I take 2, divide that by 1, that's going to be 1. When I square that, I've got 1. And I apologize, this should be a negative 5 over here. Because when I, when I move 5 over, I would be subtracting 5 from both sides. And then I just kind of swapped both sides of the equation. So this should have been a negative 5. All right, and I added 1 to the left-hand side of the equation, so I need to add 1 to the right. So this becomes x plus 1 quantity squared when I factor. This is negative 4. When I take the square root of both sides, plus or minus square root of negative 4. Now I'm going to move the 1 over, so it'll be a negative 1 plus or minus 2i. So I did get two complex values, and what that means is when I graph this, it shouldn't have any x-intercepts. So let me graph it in uh, GeoGebra and see what happens. Okay, so changed my equation to match what we're working with. And here's its graph. So if you'll notice, at, at no point does my graph cross the x-axis. Uh, the range is, you know, from positive 4 to positive infinity. It doesn't go into negative numbers at all. And in order to cross that x-axis, or touch that x-axis, it needs to at least reach 0, but it never does. So the discriminant tells us exactly what we uh, expect it to. OK, next up, locating the vertex. Well, if the equation is in standard form, f of x equals a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k, the vertex is just located at h comma k. Right? That's easy enough. Now, if the equation is in general form, f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, the vertex is located at negative b over 2a and f of negative b over 2a. So the vertex has an x and y value. Now, most times when I see the formula for the vertex, I just see x equals negative b over 2a. Well, that's the x-coordinate of the vertex. In order to figure out the y-coordinate, you have to take that value and plug it into your function. So that's where that part's coming in, because you need both an x and a y value for your vertex. Now, if you'll notice, this is actually very similar if we had um, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac here, and extended that line, we would have the quadratic formula. So this is just the part of the quadratic formula that, uh, I erased a little too much there, uh, that doesn't involve the square root. And so that tells you the x-coordinate of your vertex. Now, uh, that method works, but there's an alternate method. You can use a process of completing the square to convert the equation into general form, from general form into standard form in order to find the vertex. So I'm going to walk through a few examples of locating the vertex. And I'll do it both ways. And you can choose whichever way you prefer. Um, so let's start with f of x equals x squared plus 10x plus 16. So in order to find the vertex, I can use the vertex formula. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, 
Um, so essentially, it's x equals negative b over 2a. So uh, b is 10, so it's going to be negative 10 over 2 times a, which is 1. So the x-coordinate of the vertex is negative 5. The y-coordinate has to be calculated through the formula. So negative 5 squared plus 10 times negative 5 plus 16. And I'm just plugging negative 5 into my function. So this is 25 minus 50 plus 16. All right, so 25 minus 50 is negative 25 and plus 16. That's going to give me negative 9. So my vertex is located at negative 5, negative 9. Okay, let's take a look at this completing the square method. So the interesting thing about this completing the square method is you can't start off moving the constant to the other side because you don't have it set equal to 0. You just have it set equal to f of x. So basically, instead of that, you will just separate the constant from the other terms. Okay, now we complete the square for uh, the terms in the parentheses. So if I take 10 divided by 2, that's 5, and square that, I get 25. So I'm going to add 25 inside my parentheses. Now, I'm working with only one side of the equation, so if I add 25 here, I have to subtract 25 here, so everything cancels out to 0. So I'm not actually changing the value of the function, I'm just changing its form. Okay, so this factors as we expect. So x plus 5, quantity squared, 16 minus 25 is negative 9. So the vertex is negative 5, negative 9, just like we you know, found the other direction as well. Which one's easier? You know, for me, if I don't have a calculator, I think the um, completing the square method is easier. Uh, if you have a calculator handy, the uh, formula can be a little bit easier. Um, it, it, the, I don't really feel like there's an advantage either way. So you, you can have a choice as to which one you want to use when solving your problems. Let's take a look at the graph of this and just see and verify that this is the location of the vertex. Okay, so I have graphed the function we're working with, and here's the graph of it. Now the vertex is the low point right here, and unfortunately the scale on my axis is 2, so I don't have exactly the point I'm working with, but, you know, I would certainly say you know, at least by estimating, that this would be negative 5, negative 9, um, just like we expect it to be. Okay, our next example. y equals 3x squared minus 12x plus 16. Okay, so again, I'm going to locate the vertex both ways. So negative b, so the opposite of negative 12, divided by 2 times a, so 2 times 3. So that's 12 over 6, or 2. So the x-coordinate is 2. The y-coordinate is 3 times 2 squared minus 12 times 2 plus 16. So this would be 3 times 4, which is 12, minus 12 times 2, which is 24, plus 16. 12 minus 24 is negative 12, and plus 16, that gives me 4. So my vertex is at 2, 4 for this particular parabola. Let's see it with the completing the square. All right, so I separate my first two terms from the constant. Now, 
the process of completing the square requires that your first term have a leading term coefficient of 1. So I need to actually factor out that 3 before I apply the you know, b divided by 2 quantity squared. So if I take negative 4 divided by 2, that's 2, square that, I get 4. Now, the thing is, 3 is multiplying everything inside these parentheses here. So 3 times 4 is actually 12. 12 is what I'm actually adding to this side of the equation, which means over here I need to subtract 12. It's very confusing at first, I understand. You think you want to add, you want to subtract 12, or tr subtract 4. But because of this 3 out here, multiplying everything in the parentheses, you are in fact adding 12 to both sides, or to this side, so you need to subtract 12 over here to counteract that. Okay, so if you're still with me there, uh, the rest of this is pretty straightforward. So this uh, perfect square trinomial factors exactly as we would expect it to. 16 minus 12 would be plus 4. So my vertex here, 2, 4. Remember, it's the opposite of that number and the literal of that number. OK, so then what I want to do is graph this for you just to kind of verify that this is uh, the situation. So let me pull that up. Okay, here are the graph. Here's the graph. And right here is the vertex of that graph. And if you'll notice, it looks like it's definitely at the point 2, 4, exactly as we solved. Okay, one last example like this. So let's uh, scroll down here g of x equals negative 2x squared plus 4x minus 3. All right, so using the formula, negative b, so it's going to be negative 4, over 2 times a, so negative 4 divided by negative 4, that's positive 1. So the y-coordinate is going to be negative 2 times 1 squared, plus 4 times 1, minus 3. So negative 2 plus 4 minus 3. That's 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. So my vertex is at 1, negative 1. The completing the square process, I have g of x equals, and I'm going to separate the pieces that have an x from the constant. And I need to factor out negative 2. Now, completing the square, if I take negative 2 divided by 2, that's negative 1. And if I square that, I'm adding 1. But I'm not adding 1 to this side of the equation because everything in these parentheses is multiplied by negative 2. So negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. So I'm actually subtracting 2 right here. To counteract that, I need to add 2 over here. Okay, so then I'm effectively adding 0 to this side of the equation. Now, uh, once that's done, the polynomial x squared minus 2x plus 1 factors into x minus 1 squared and a negative 1 on the outside, so that my vertex is 1, negative 1. All right, so let's just look at a quick graph and verify. And here it is. So I am graphing the equation that we're working with here. Uh, if you notice, the parabola is opening downward. The leading term coefficient is negative. And my vertex, located right here, this would be positive 1, negative 1 on the y. So located exactly where we expect it to be. Okay.
let's put everything together and graph a quadratic. So I want to graph f of x equals negative 3x squared plus 6x plus 1. And I've got an axis over here that will work for us. So to do this, let's see. Um, let's start with something simple, y-intercept. Well, remember, I'm just calculating f of 0. Uh, f of 0, if I let x equal 0, everything but the, can the constant cancels out. So my y-intercept is at the point 0, 1. So I can go ahead and plot that. My x-intercepts. I need to um, basically set this equation equal to 0 and solve. But let's see what types of zeros I should expect. And I can figure that out through my discriminant. Because it's possible I don't have any x-intercepts. So let's see what happens. So this would be so 6 squared minus 4 times a, which is negative 3, times c. 36, uh, this will be plus 12, which is 48. So it's a positive number, so that tells me I do have two x-intercepts, but it's not a perfect square, so they're not gonna, they're gonna happen at irrational numbers, so that's not gonna happen at a nice clean integer value. Um, but that also tells me that factoring this quadratic isn't going to work, so I might as well just go straight to the quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus the square root of, you know, it's kind of nice about already knowing the value of b squared minus 4ac is just plug that in, all over 2a. So negative 6 plus or minus 48 could be 16 times 3. 16 is a perfect square. It would come out as a positive 4. And I could factor out, say, negative 2 in the numerator. And factoring out a negative 2 is kind of strange because, you know, the thing about that is. Um, the plus or minus here technically would kind of reverse and become minus plus, but you need both answers anyway, so it doesn't really matter, you know, what's negative there, because we're bo using both the positive and the negative. Negative 2 cancels into negative 6 and leaves me with 3. So I have 3 plus or minus 2 root 3 divided by 3 which is like 1 plus or minus 2 root 3 over 3. Which isn't all that helpful in terms of, you know, locating uh, the x and y intercepts. So I'm going to estimate what that value is by bringing up the calculator here. Okay, so here's the calculator, and I want to figure out what... 1 plus or minus 2 root 3 over 3 is. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm first, I'll first do 1 plus, and then to do 2 root 3 over 3, I will do 2 times the square root of 3 divided by 3 that way. Now, order of operations will be just fine. Um, it will know to do this multiplication first, and then this division, and lastly this addition. So. I don't need to worry about order of operations here. That'll work out just fine. So I have this being approximately 2.15. And if I do 1 minus 2 root 3, oops, I need to close that parentheses, though. Because if I didn't close that parentheses, it would think that my divide is underneath the square root as well. All right, so then negative 0.15.
So uh, the best I can do is just estimate where these things are. They're on the x-axis. So 2.15, let's just put it right there. Negative 0.15, let's put it right there. Okay, uh, so those are my x-intercepts. And let's now go and figure out uh, the location of the vertex. So the vertex, let's do it this way. We can uh, choose to either use the formula or the completing the square method. Uh, most students end up choosing the formula in the end, so that's where the way I'll go here. So the x-coordinate is going to be negative b, so that's a 6, so negative 6 over 2 times a. So this is negative 6 over negative 6, which is 1. Then the y-coordinate is just the function evaluated at 1. So negative 3 times 1 squared plus 6 times 1 plus 1. So negative 3 plus 6 plus 1 or 3 plus 1, which is 4. So the coordinates of my vertex, 1, 4. All right, so let's plot that. So 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's right there. And so I think we have a pretty good uh, set of points here to get a graph of this parabola. Um, all the important points are really kind of illustrated here. Um, one additional point we could get, if you don't forget your axis of symmetry going through the vertex, if the y-intercept is one unit to the left, uh, then there's another point because of the symmetry that's one unit to the right. So we could do that as well. But the last thing to do is just draw a sketch of your parabola uh, through the points that you have. Now the next example I want to do here is I want to find the zeros in the vertex of a parabola on the calculator. Uh, this is a skill that's going to be very helpful for you um, as you as you are you know going through the class um, being able to work with this calculator accurately. So let's learn how to find the zeros in vertex um, just straight from the calculator. So I'm going to clear what I have so far and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to graph this parabola. I'm going to graph it on my calculator. So to do so, I hit y equals, and that lets me put in any number of functions. I think maybe there's a maximum of nine or so um, uh, that are going to be graphed. So I want to put in my function. Now one thing you want to be careful of is the calculator differentiates between negative three and minus three. If you put minus three times x squared, you're going to get an error message. So um, you want to make sure you do a negative, which is the key underneath the 3, and then a 3. All right, and then we have x squared, right, so that's fine, plus 6x. And you can do alpha and the STO button to get an x as well, if you're noticing green. Um, any any value that you want to get in green, you just press the green key first. Any value you want to get in yellow, press the yellow key first. Um, but this button that says x, t, theta, and n, um, it'll give you an x in most situations, so a little bit easier. All right, then plus one. Okay, now uh, the calculator should be set up. You might want to check your window and just kind of make sure the default viewing window is, is set there. So negative 10 to positive 10 on the x, a scale of 1, negative 10 to positive 10 on the y, and a scale of 1 as well. The x resolution, um, just leave it as 1, that's fine. And then just press graph, and you should be able to get you know a graph of this function. Now, if you did get an error message, it's very likely that you have a statistical plot set up. Um, so you can go and turn statistical plots on and off if you just got an error message by if you go if you hit second and y equals because if you notice it says stat plot and just make sure 
all of these statistical plots are turned off. So you can actually whoops, uh, come down here to uh, plots off, and that'll turn them all off, and you're good. All right, now if you hit graph, you should be able to see what I'm seeing. Now, um, so we can visually see, you know, the location of intercepts and the vertex, but the resolution on the calculator is really not very good at all. So one thing that would be nice is if we scrolled in uh, to kind of see a little bit better picture of just, say, like this area right here. Now, there's different ways of zooming in for this uh, calculator. The easiest way, if you can actually see all the stuff on screen, is to use what's called a zoom rectangle or a zoom box. It's the very first zoom option. So what it does is it gives you a little crosshairs that you can kind of move around with your arrow keys. And you're just going to set your crosshairs at one, uh, one location that will be um, a corner of a rectangle, that, of the viewing rectangle that you want to use, and then press Enter, and then drag the other corner of the viewing rectangle that you want to use, and press Enter again, and it'll reset the view of the calculator so that you're just seeing that portion. So that's much better. Now, originally, it looked like my x-intercepts were 0 and 2. But unfortunately, now that we've zoomed in, it doesn't quite look that way. So let's talk about uh, the vertex first, and then we'll come to that those intercepts. So the vertex, it appears to be at you know, one, four. But let's, let's just see, you know, what we can figure out about that. Now, one way to determine locations on the graph, if you'll notice, um, you have x-coordinate, y-coordinate of the current location of your cursor. So if you just keep moving the cursor, until you get to about where that vertex is, okay, then you get something that is relatively close to the uh, vertex itself. Now, here's the thing. Let me erase what I've drawn up here so I can make sure I'm getting pretty close to that point. If you'll notice the coordinates of this vertex, I've got, you know, like 1.004, 4.04. It's, it's not really exactly at 1.4. And the problem is this cursor is not necessarily lying directly on the graph because I can move the cursor anywhere on screen and not necessarily it being part of the graph itself. You can get a little bit better estimate uh, by using what's called a trace feature. So this blue button here that says trace, now your cursor is kind of stuck to the graph. Well, now you scroll up to about where the vertex is. And again, you can get really close to where the vertex is, but you can't really get exactly where the vertex is. Um, and it all comes down to the resolution of the calculator. It's not exactly HD here. so. Um, you can never get a very good value here um, just this way. You have to actually do some calculations in order to come up with the location of the vertex. So luckily, we have the menu. If you hit second and trace, it says calc. Well, there's different calculations that you can do for the graph that you're looking at. We're looking for a maximum because that's where the uh, vertex is in this case, it's a maximum value. And it's asking for three things. It's asking for a left bound, a right bound, and an initial guess. And so here's what it's looking for. Like we can visually see that the vertex is about right there. The computer can't visually see that. All it knows is there's some 
uh, pixels turned on and some pixels turned off. It can't really interpret any of that. So it basically wants us to kind of give it some restrictions. So somewhere between this value and this value, there is a vertex. So it wants us to kind of get closer in on that. And then it wants us to make an initial guess. So, um, so if I put my left bound in as, say, like negative uh, 5, and I can just type in the left bound, that's fine. So if I hit negative 5 for my left, oh, sorry, negative 0.5 for my left bound, OK. So, oh, I should have done positive 0.5. It's not a big deal, but um, I meant positive 0.5. So basically, I'm telling it, you know, here's the left bound of my, um, of what I'm looking at. My right bound, um, I'm going to put, say, uh, two. All right, so you can actually kind of scroll along and get these right bounds as well. It just sometimes takes a little longer to scroll over than to just type in two. All right, so then here's my right bound. So I'm saying that somewhere between these two numbers, between here and here, there is a vertex. Now it wants an initial guess. And the initial guess doesn't really matter what you put. It's just the closer you put it to the actual value, the faster it's going to calculate it. So I'm estimating it's at um, x equals 1. So my initial guess is going to be 1. Now when it calculates, does its thing, and it finds that maximum precisely. So it finds it at 1, 4. That's how you have to go and find these things on the calculator. So let's, let's write over here, uh, my vertex is at 1, 4. All right, now knowing all that, the rest of these will be a little bit easier to do. Um, the process is similar for the intercepts. Uh, so I will come down here and calculate a zero, because um, the zero is where we cross the y-axis. Again, it wants a left bound, a right bound, and an in initial guess. So I'm going to try and find this lower one down here. So right there is what I'm looking for. So my left bound. I think I'll just use negative 1 and say positive 1. So it's somewhere in, be in that range right there, from negative 1 to positive 1. So between here and here. Um, my initial guess, I'll just put it at 0. Like I said, it doesn't really matter what you'd use for your initial guess. Just get it close. And so now it finds that and it reports that one x-intercept is at uh, negative 0.15 approximately and 0. And then if I do the same process for the upper one, so if I do second in calc, 0. The left bound, I think I'll just do positive 1 and the right bound, I'll do 3. So somewhere in between there, and I'm guessing that it's at 2. And it's going to calculate it at 2.15. So 2.15 comma 0. So I now found my intercepts, my x-intercepts, and my vertex using the calculator. The important thing to understand is make sure you're using the um, the calculation features rather than just tracing the graph or just moving the cursor as close as possible. Because in doing that, you'd never really get the zero at 2.1547. You might get something close to that, but you'd never get that. So. All right, in this last part, I've brought up the homework um, just because I want you to see how to graph the quadratic when you're asked to. because. It's actually different from you know lessons that we did earlier in the class. So uh, I've got x squared plus two, or x plus two quantity squared minus one that I need to graph. 
And the first thing that I'll do is uh, just make the graph larger so I can see it a little bit better on screen. And the way this is going to work is you're going to choose the parabola tool. And you know what, I need to scooch this over so I can see my graph or my equation. So find the vertex first, and you're going to plot that. So the vertex is going to be at negative 2, negative 1. So I'll plot that there. Now the first thing that it does is it gives you a line here. But if you move your cursor and uh, look for another point that would be on your parabola, um, it will graph the, parab the shape of the parabola for you. So the easiest thing to do is if like you know the value of a, uh, in this case, which is 1, if you go over to the right one and up one, that's where the next point's going to be. Um, if you like, you could come up with, say, the y-intercept. And you could use the y-intercept as another point. Or if you solve the, para the quadratic and figure out where the x-intercepts are, you could use those points as well. You just need to come up with two points that would be on your parabola and then it will draw it for you. At that point, you can hit save and um, check your answer, and it will ask you uh, a bunch of other related questions to your graph, but the important thing is knowing how to graph it. So that should get you started in your homework.